Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a special webinar we're holding this month um, off of our normal First Tuesday webinar. This, the title of this one is Advocacy, Ethics, and the Law for Libraries. And we're really pleased to be offering this today. We, our speaker is Rob Mead. So let me go through a little bit here and just do my business, first of all. Here, I, my name's Nona Burling. I'm your facilitator today, which basically means you get me introducing things. For technical support, we have Jeremy Stroud. So if anyone is having any te technical difficulties, Jeremy, why don't you put your information into the chat so once this slide goes away, people have it. If you're having trouble connecting or um, volume troubles, whatever, Jeremy is the perfect person to help you. So you can just send him a message or give him a call and he will get back to you. And there, I see it just showed up in the chat. I wanted to let you know that this webinar is brought to you by the Washington State Library, which is part of the Office of the Secretary of State. And our funder is the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And while I'm mentioning IMLIS, I will say that at the very end, when you opened up your webinar, it opened up a a window on your browser that has a survey. It's a four question survey. We need to do this for our endless funding. If you have the time and be, it should not take much, but it, we'd really appreciate it if you fill out the survey. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about Rob. Rob is the state law librarian for Washington. He manages the law library at the Temple of Justice here in Olympia. And he's been in this position since October of 2016. Before moving to Washington, Rob was the Deputy Chief Public Defender for New Mexico and was also the New Mexico State Law Librarian and an academic law librarian at the University of Kansas and the University of New Mexico. He is also a member of the Washington and New Mexico Bar Association. So he has quite the credentials and we're very grateful that he was willing to present this information because I think it's something we all need as we all of us want to advocate for our libraries. Um, I wanted to say before I turn it over to Rob that he has scheduled breaks throughout his presentation for questions. So if you have questions as they come up, just add them to the chat box and when we have a break, we'll read them and get back to them. So that's all I have to say and take it away, Rob. Thank you so much and thank you to the State Library for the opportunity to do this webinar today. Um, webinar formats are always a little tricky. And uh, if I'm echoing, I'm sorry, the room I'm in has a high ceiling. Um, and I, as she said, I will be stopping periodically for questions. So please uh, hold your questions or put them into chat and then I will answer them at periodic points throughout the presentation. So what I'm going to try to do today is triangulate three concepts, advocacy by librarians, library ethical considerations in light of the legal restrictions on lobbying and advocacy for public libraries. I'm not giving any legal advice today. I'm just ballparking issues. That's for a couple of reasons. One, I can't in the course of my particular employment act as anybody's lawyer. But more importantly, I'm new, to, I'm new to Washington. I'm new to Washington law. And so I'm just learning some of these details and they vary state by state. And so if you do have specific legal questions on this material, each of your libraries should have access to general counsel through your chain of command. And you should um, feel free to ask general counsel or your, your, your attorney about specific problems or issues. Also as a caveat, this isn't comprehensive. In an hour there's um, not enough time. We might be able to fit everything in in a day or it might take two, but this is a, an overview. And finally, and for myself most importantly, I'm not speaking for the court today and we're going to get into that a little bit as to why that's an important caveat for this for me in particular is that in my role there are times when I officially speak for the court and there are times when I don't. So we're at a critical intersection in society today when some of the norms that we've enjoyed through the course of our lives are beginning to 
fray around the edges and institutions are threatened and things feel frightening and unsettled and libraries are right in the thick of things. Um, for example, when Freddie Gray died in Baltimore in the back of a police van in handcuffs in 2015 and the community expressed outrage over that incident, incident the Enoch Pratt Free Library under the leadership of Dr. Carla Hayden, now the Librarian of Congress, kept their libraries open. American Libraries interviewed her and she said that the library has been open the entire time. The library has been the community's anchor. It's the heart of the community, good times and bad times. In a lot of communities in Baltimore, especially challenged ones, we are the only resource. If we close, we're sending a signal that we're afraid or that we aren't going to be available when times are tough. We should only be open, or we should be open, especially when times are tough. I didn't hesitate. My only hesitation was to tell my 83-year-old mother that I was going down to the epicenter. But she was a social worker in Chicago. So her response was, oh, make sure you have coffee and take water for the people and don't forget the cups and the napkins. Other libraries have had to close briefly in, in the face of hatred and violence. And it made it the other choice, also perfectly valid, of protecting their patrons in the light of danger. For example, Jefferson Madison Regional Library administrators were on the front lines during the Charlottesville protests when they chose to close the library for the day, secure the facility, and support local law enforcement. In the lead up to the protest, white supremacists were already targeting the library. Um, the, the assistant director, Chris DeFerrell, said, last Thursday the 10th, library staff noticed upon opening at 9 a.m. the white supremacist signage had been placed on the front door of the building overnight, which we quick, quick, quickly removed. In addition to closing the library, officials removed outdoor trash cans and the police removed bricks from around the library garden so they couldn't be used from harm. During the day of, of the Charlottesville protests and counter protests, the director, John Halliday, was the only staff member in the, the locked building that day. And he allowed law enforcement to use the facilities, docking area, bathrooms, and electricity. Again, a different kind of advocacy, an advocacy that promotes safety. Librarians also advocate for truth and intellectual freedom in the face of opposition. Librarians were at the forefront in the fight against overreach in the OSA Patriot Act. And you can see the, the cover from the nation, not your grandmother's librarian fighting Big Brother in a digital, digital age. And then we've seen plenty of great librarian signs during the various protests during the past year. You know things are messed up when librarians start marching. Even in our day-to-day -day work, we see advocacy for unbiased, accurate information is key to our profession. And a great example of this is from the King County Library System and their DACA in Washington, a guide that directs its patrons to the cutting edge information produced by the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project, which has been just instrumental in protecting immigrants in our communities in Washington. When it comes to funding, you know, all of this is on top of our regular work of maintaining balanced collections, advocating for adequate funding for our collections and programming. And there's been plenty of direct challenges to libraries beyond the market challenges caused by the internet and changes to society. For instance, in, in March of 2017, the Trump administration released its draft budget for Congress to consider, and it advocated eliminating funding for MLS except for 23 million to shut down operations. Fortunately, grassroots lobbying by library supporters helped by partisan friends of libraries in both the House and the Senate secure standard current funding levels in the House and then even add 4 million in the Senate budget. And we're still waiting to see if Congress can manage to pass a budget in the next few weeks for, for fiscal year 18. The American Libraries recently reported that a bipartisan group in the Senate introduced Senate Bill 2271 on December 21st 
reauthorizing endless. So advocacy is critical both for our patrons and our institutions. But what is advocacy? So Merriam-Webster suggests that advocacy is the act or process of supporting a cause or proposal. And it, it harkens back to Greek and Latin roots. So in, in the Latin, it's avocatus, I call, I summon, I call for an advocate. I call for someone to argue my case. In the Greek, it's a parakletos, call to one side. It's used to describe somebody who pleaded another's cause or helped others by defending or comforting them. In America today, in the law, there's, in a, it, this draws from uh, federal financial campaign law issues. There's, there's express advocacy and issue advocacy. Express advocacy is expressly supporting a particular candidate or a particular ballot measure. Whereas issue advocacy is more general issues like we, we support the clean, clean environment, we support intellectual freedom. It's, it's advocacy around a particular issue that doesn't promote a particular candidate or a particular ballot proposal. And there's bleed over between these two categories and there's volumes of federal campaign law focusing on when and where you can restrict certain types of communication dealing with particular types of advocacy. So at this point, I'm going to stop for questions and see if anybody has particular questions that they would like to share or ask. I have not seen questions come in yet, Rob, but you okay. can give people time to see if they want to type. Okay, so I'm going to continue and get down into more of the, the definitional side of things. So in Washington, we have a, a definition of lobbying, and it's from the, the Revised Code of Washington, which I'll just call RCW from this point forward, 4217A005. Lobby and lobbying each mean attempting to influence the passage or defeat of any legislation by the legislature of the state of Washington or the adoption or rejection of any rule, standard, rate, or other legislative enactment of any state agency under the State Administrative Procedure Act. Neither lobby nor lobbying includes an association or other organizations act to communicate with members of that association or organization. Okay, so I have a question um, that I'm going to stop and answer now. Do you have any advice for approaching the press in the course of advocacy work? There's good opportunities to talk to the press um, proactively and to um, promote the library's messaging uh, about what you want to have happen with particular issues, but there's rules about that if it's, if it's governing um, a particular ballot measure, for instance, uh, lifting a levy lid or uh, supporting a bond issue. And we'll talk about those rules in a minute. Um, in general, if you're just promoting issues like intellectual freedom, I think it's a good practice to know the reporters in your town or in your area that cover particular issues and to um, talk to them, reach out to them, invite them to library functions. The same is true with your local politicians of, of really getting to know the people who either vote on issues that affect your library or who will write about issues that affect your library. So I guess that's the first piece of advice is know who they are, reach out. They may reach out to you it's very helpful when you get a press question to already know the person and already know 
some of um, how they approach issues and not to be caught cold answering questions that um, you don't know the person who's asking the question. So I think that's the, the big picture. If you're, if you're advocating for particular issues outside of um, your official duties, you're, you're going to want to be careful not to um, blend work and um, your private advocacy and not use your position as a librarian in a particular library as a way to get access to the press. That, that's a recipe for um, confusion, a recipe for potential trouble, and you just be real clear. You can say you're a librarian, but, I, but don't invoke yourself inside a particular system or um, speak for the system if you don't have official clearance to do so. So I'm going to talk more about some of the restrictions on um, official lobbying in a moment and official advocacy. Um, so I'm going to move on from here. Everything we do should be done within the context as professionals of, of our ethics as librarians. And it's, it's funny for me as an attorney to think about ethics, mostly because as an attorney, you learn ethics as a rigid, relatively rigid code of conduct, which can get you disbarred if you violate it. And so there are particular sorts of activities as a lawyer you do because of the, your client's needs and because you're in a system that's set up that the truth is found through an adversarial process. And so you're not allowed to actively lie to the court, but you, you are expected to zealously advocate for your client and to present the evidence which uh, best supports your client's position. If you don't do that, you're not doing justice by your client. It's a different sort of ethics. Librarian ethics and the ethics of many other professions are more aspirational in nature and aren't tied to our particular jobs unless we grossly violate them. And so there, it's more of a, a, of a worldview, of, of, of a colored lens in our glasses through which we view both our profession, our previous education experience and the way we approach the work we do every day. I love the introduction to the ALA's Code of Ethics. We significantly influence or control the selection, organization, preservation, dissemination of information. In a political system grounded in an informed citizenry, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information. We have, special, we have a special obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present to present and future generations. There's specific clauses inside the code of ethics that I'm gonna go over. It, you know, we've, we've pretty much all seen this in library school, but I want to, to just harken back to those days. We provide the, the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous response to all requests. Two, we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. Three, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. Four, we respect intellectual property rights and advocate balance between interests of information users and rights holders. Five, we treat coworkers and other colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of all employees of our institutions. Six, we do not advance private interests at the expense of library users, colleagues, or our employing institutions. Seven, we distinguish between our personal convictions and professional duties. We do not allow our personal beliefs to interfere with fair representation of the aims of our institutions or the provision of access to their information resources. And finally, eight, 
We strive for excellence in the profession by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills, by encouraging the professional development of coworkers, and by fostering the aspirations of potential members of the profession. ALA notes that the principles of this code are expressed in a broad statement to guide ethical decision making. These statements provide a framework they cannot and do not dictate conduct to cover particular situations. So in general, this idea of, of equity, um, truth, equality, democracy, liberty, the values that are embedded inside this ethical code give us good ground as librarians and libraries on which to assert the benefit we can provide to our democracy. When we build collections that are balanced and fair and truthful, and we get the information to people who actually need the information we have, we do democracy's work. Now, different types of libraries might add additional components to these values. So school libraries may add their own ethical standards on top of these sorts of values. For law libraries, we value the access to justice and emphasize the importance of access to legal information as foundational to the rule of law. One of the key questions it is how our values inform our professional advocacy. So one key concept is that we stand up for all users. We, we should advocate to provide accurate, unbiased information for all. For dreamers looking for protection for their rights in this country, for LGBTQ youth, for prisoners, for people with mental illness, and others that society rejects. We advocate for privacy and intellectual freedom. We stand for the fair representation of the aims of institutions. When we speak for the library and advocate for the needs of the library and its patrons, we do so even if they conflict with our own views. Let me give an example. As the state law librarian, I work directly for the justices of the Washington Supreme Court. But before taking this position, I spent two and a half years as the Deputy Chief Public Defender for New Mexico. I have very strong and relatively radical views on the importance of public defense, the need for adequate funding, and the existence of systemic bias in the criminal justice system. But the court I work for needs to remain neutral and unbiased towards both sides of the system. Justice needs to remain blind. So in my role at work, as the state law librarian, I must respect the needs of the institution I serve and speak for the court on issues of equal access to legal information and improve self-help material for legal researchers and the like, rather than using my position and the goodwill earned by the library through service to advocate for my political beliefs about public defense. I need to very carefully parse out my professional advocacy for my personal advocacy and then carefully avoid using my, posi my position or my library's resources to advance my personal agenda. That's just an example of, you know, where do we park ourselves value-wise? Do we, are we clearly in the center of those uh, professional values that we advance, or are we drifting on the edge to things that if we, you know, squint and look crosswise might be considered a library of value. They may be critical to our society. They may be, you know, firmly good moral things, but aren't necessarily with squarely within the values that librarians professionally hold. This comes up with, in, in, at a legal level, with employees and free speech. And so, Public employee free speech is important uh, for, for people who work for government institutions like libraries because it affects the First Amendment rights of, you know, in this country, you know, nearly 20 million people. The general public has an interest in government, governmental transparency. 
and, and punishing employees for speech may have adverse effects, um, such as suppressing useful speech or, or deterring whistleblowing. So the public has an interest in free speech by public employees. There's two Supreme Court cases from the US Supreme Court that are critical on this. One is uh, Pickering versus the Board of Education of Township High School District 205 from 1967. Pickering dealt with a teacher who was fired from his position after he sent a letter to a local newspaper that was critical of the school board's overfunding of athletics at the expense of education. He argued that you know, too much money is being spent on athletics, not enough on the classroom. The court decided in Pickering's favor and found that his freedom of speech rights were violated when he was terminated for writing the letter. The court balanced the interests of Pickering with those of the school's administration and found that since the speech touched on matters of public concern, Pickering's and the public's interests outweighed the administration's interest in suppressing his speech. For the Pickering test to be applicable, the employee must be addressing a matter of public concern. The speech cannot interfere with the employee's job duties and the employee must be speaking as a private citizen. So those tests, you know, are you speaking as a private citizen or are you speaking inside your official job duties it is, it is really critical. The second case is Garcetti versus Sebeleus uh, 2006 case and dealt with a First Amendment challenge from a deputy district attorney who alleged retaliatory employment actions because he relayed concerns of pot potential police misconduct to his supervisors in the memorandum. So he's essentially saying, I'm a whistleblower. I blew the whistle on misconduct to my supervisors. And then when I complained about it, I was retaliated against. The court focused on whether his speech was made pursuant to doing his district attorney's official job duties. And by doing so, the court limited the free speech rights of public employees, finding that the memo was made pursuant to his official job duties and that his memo was, you know, his supervisors found his memo out of line and that he wasn't speaking as a citizen on matters of public concern. And the First Amendment therefore did not protect his speech. He was properly disciplined. So the question of, you know, are you speaking at work? Are you speaking for work? Is, is critical. And some of us have jobs where we do speak for libraries and for the values and the ethics of libraries as part of our daily jobs. All of us promote those values. Some of us officially speak for those values and for those issues. But when we're speaking for other advocacy issues and that are outside of our official job duties, our employer has some interest in what we're saying and how we're saying it. We need to be careful that we don't do it at work, on work time and, and cloud, whether we're speaking for ourselves or speaking for the library we work for. So that's in a nutshell, the broad outlines of issue advocacy and you know, not specific advocacy for specific campaigns where the public is going to vote on either people or funding or other, you know, public initiatives and those sorts of things. So I'm going to stop here and answer any questions folks have about issue advocacy, about speaking up for society and society's changes before we get on to that express advocacy where we talk about politics. Um, once again, Rob, there have not been questions, but people may be putting them in now so we can take a few minutes.
Um, Rob, we have a question from Lorena. Um, what about things like book displays? Do we need to show mul multiple points of view? They need to be fair and balanced. And the question is, are there fair and balanced points of view that are, you know, things that we can promote? Do we have to promote two sides of every issue? Do we have to give space to white supremacy? Um, no. <laughs> that, that our values in general are pretty clear that, that there are certain things that are, um, if we go back to our values and look at them, that we're providing appropriate, usefully organized resources in, in equitable access. And so we're, we're not resisting, or we're resisting censorship, but we need to make sure that we are also supporting equity and, and the broad concepts of democracy and freedom. So in general, yes, multiple points of view um, is on every issue, not necessarily. And so legally, are we censoring? Are we you know, saying that certain items or certain books are, can't be bought with public funds because of the issues they cover? No, but are we advocating broadly um, when we, in a multiple points of view, I think is a, is a good starting place. So I know that's a muddled answer but the, the boundaries are difficult without sort of a, an actual pile of books that you're thinking about and display as now. What books do, are we promoting and why? Um, Rob, this is Nono and I might just put in an example of, I know one of the local libraries here a few years ago did a Black Lives Matter book display and they got a lot of heat for it. Um, it would, it be, I mean, I heard what you said about, no, we don't need to do a white supremacist book display to balance that out. But how, what would be a good response to this library if they're getting challenged on a Black Lives Matter book display? I'm curious as to, to more about what the challenge was. Was it because they weren't uh, providing a fair and balanced viewpoint towards um, the needs of the police? or because black lives don't matter you know it, there, there's some some hard questions sort of embedded in there and in increasing you know it, it, it giving it in your selection policies making sure that you're selecting materials that are um, timely and balanced is important um, it's difficult to find um, things that talk about the appropriateness of the um, institutional attack on African-American men by the criminal justice system. You know, it's implicit bias, it's not explicit bias necessarily, but it's difficult in finding supportive material. So it's sort of hard to create balance when there isn't much in the literature, you've got a one-sided issue. So, you know, and again, I'm being muddled, but that sort of, response is, is um, I can see the heat coming, but you're, you're, you're presenting the material that's available. And as long as you're not, you know, turning yourself into an advocate for that particular public issue and just presenting the, you know, the book display, um, I think we're on safe ground and fair ground. Okay, so we have another question. What about a library advocating displaying information for the Women's March, similarly muddled. Um, so you're displaying information and about women's issues and about gender equity issues in America. Um, there's not going to be a lot of, you know, counter information out there that's published that we're selecting and, and adding to our collections and sort of a um, through our normal selection development process. There may be some, and there are times when I think it, you know, you could find counter information. Um, do you, does your library send an official 
uh, delegation to the Women's March where you're marching with the library sign? Probably not. I think that that's mixing your official duties and your private duty, your private political response a bit much and it putting in sort of dangerous political ground, maybe not dangerous legal ground, but dangerous political ground um, and open yourself to criticism. But displaying information about a woman's march, um, I think is, is, you know, fair game for a library if that's what your patrons are looking for, if that's what your patrons are asking about. Other questions? Again, we're, we're taking our professional training and applying it to society and finding the information our patrons want and the information our patrons need. And we're not prejudging the outcome on particular things. And so putting, you know, collecting and displaying the things that we're providing um, are things that libraries have always done. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and talk about legal restrictions now. So what does the law have to say about library advocacy? Where do we get ourselves in trouble? The political trouble of putting out information about Black Lives Matter or the women's marches is, is one brand of trouble. That can get you in trouble with your, your taxpayers that's supporting your library, potentially, or some of them, or create controversy that harms the library, maybe. If you get deeply involved in express advocacy, where you're expressly supporting a particular candidate, or you're expressly supporting particular ballot initiatives, there's a lot more legal restriction. And you need to really, it, it's not just a political restriction, it rises to the level of law. And so I'm gonna talk about a number of these legal restrictions and, and Again, this is super cursory. This, you know, an expert in this area could go all day. Uh, but I want to point out in sort of a jurisdictional ranking here about particular things you need to know about. One is the Hatch Act. And this is the federal prohibition on um, mixing um, lobbying and political activity with federal money. We'll talk about it in more detail in just a moment. Secondly, there's explicit prohibitions in federal law on lobbying with federal funds. In Washington, there's RCW 4252, Ethics and Public Service, that governs what state employees can do. Correspondingly, there's RCW 4217A, Campaign Disclosure and Contribution Law, that governs what both state employees and some local governmental employees who are using tax money can and can't do. And then finally, there are local ordinances such as uh, the King County Code um, that mirror some of what's in state law and apply it explicitly at a county or city level. And so you have to pay attention to what your local ordinance are if you're a creature of county government, if your library is, is brought into existence by county government or a city government, you have to know what your ordinances are and what the state law is and what the federal law is if you're spending tax money. So let's jump into the, the Hatch Act. Hatch Act was brought around in the late 1930s um, in response to allegations that FDR's New Deal projects like the WPA were essentially trading jobs for political favors. And it, it restricted what public, what federal employees can do politically. And it was a coalition of Republicans and conservative Democrats in responses to perceived and real abuses by progressives on uh, mixing politics and work. And so the official title is the Act to Prevent Pernicious Political Activities. It sounds like a modern statutory title. Uh, much more salacious than most of the statutory titles of the day. Uh, and you can find it in U.S. Code, Title V, Section 7, 7321 through 7326. 
It explicitly forbids intimidation or bribery of voters, um, and it controls and shuts down, in many ways, the political activity of federal employees. In about 1940, it was applied to state and local employees who received federal funds. That's sort of the beginning of World War II. Um, it prohibits employees from running for partisan races, and it pro prohibits using a, your position to influence an election. So it, it, there's a lot of Hatch Act rules, and it ties down what you can do with federal money. Some of the alleged abuses of or, or overreach of the Hatch Act was dealt with um, in 2012 with the Hatch Act Modernization Act. And th this act amended it and said that unless your job is 100% paid for federal funds, now state and local employees may now, who, who are in agencies that get some federal money, may now run for partisan public office. So if you have a grant job that's paid for federal money, you can't run, still can't run for partisan public office. You can't use public funds to support partisan activity or coerce public employees to get involved in partisan activity. And the remedy, the new remedy is, uh, the old remedy was anybody who did it just got fired. The new remedy is um, e equally harsh. If, if somebody does do this and violates the Hatch Act, you can remove the employee or the state or local agency forfeits part of the federal funds equal to two years of the employee's salary. And so it's a, it's a serious act. It's important for us because when you take endless money, it travels with that money. So the Hatch Act applies to any institution that gets federal money and it, it dribbles down all the way down to the state and local levels. And so you have to pay attention to, to what you're doing with public funds, especially federal funds, and are you doing partisan things with it? Are you doing Republican or Democratic so, or in, you know, third party activities with that money? In addition to the Hatch Act, we have uh, federal lobbying prohibitions, which explicitly in 31 U.S.C. 1352 um, prohibit recipients of federal funds from using funds to lobby or obtain or extend an award. You can't use funds to go get more, more funds. You can't use federal funds. The use of non-federal funds for lobbying can be done, but it must be reported to the awarding agency. If you violate this, there are now remedies of fines that for to the agency that run between you know, 10 and 100 K um, you can lose that particular grant or award, and then the institution can be suspended or debarred from future awards, be put on a blacklist, and not be eligible for more federal funds. So again, there's, there's tight restrictions on advocacy and lobbying with federal funds. So I'm gonna stop here and answer a question I just got. May an individual state or local employee who uses federal LSTA funds advocate for the reauthorization and or funding of that legislation? It's a good question. Um, and there's particular um, answers <laughs> to that question that require more questions. And lawyers often accused of just asking questions and not providing answers, but um, are you doing this in your official capacity? So are you doing it at work? If you're not doing it in your official capacity, are you doing it using uh, your, your resources at work? And then there's a difference between um, and, and the answer is no, not at work, not from, not from home or not at work from home, are you, the reauthorization is safe ground. The funding for particular awards gets tricky, especially if you are a recipient agency of that funding. So you need to make sure that, um, are you lobbying under the 
you know, technical definition of lobbying, and there's, there's lots and lots of law defining what lobbying is for your particular agency, whether it's the state library or a recipient, you know, the, the state library flows through federal funds to recipients or a recipient agency. Are you lobbying for your agency? Um, that's treated differently than are you simply saying, um, you know, dear Senator Murray, please support endless um, it's critical for libraries in Washington. I'm a librarian. That's a, and you did it on your home computer. That's perfectly fine in, in every situation. If, but if you're doing it at work and you're advocating and lobbying for your agency, you have to follow um, explicit rules that we can go into more detail offline. But, but you know, it, it depends who you are and what you're doing. So I'm going to now switch to the moment to the internet. And it's easier to look at the Washington material. Directly live and online. I'm hoping that the internet's happy and fast today. Um, so the last 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on the interplay between two parts of Washington law, uh, what the revised code of Washington, RCW 4217A and 4252. So, so but let's start by looking at a specific case um, of an employee who crossed the line thinking that she was doing something right. And that employee was Teresa Knudsen Knudsen of um, uh, an instructor at Spokane Community College. She, she sent an email from her work account on a work computer asking her colleagues, her faculty colleagues, to urge legislators to support two bills that would provide tenure like protection for part time faculty. The email stated in part that you can view the bill at the following website. You remember to contact your legislators on personal email and the legislators email addresses are then listed in the email. Tell any of your personal problems of lack of job security. You can mention as well that this bill has no cost associated with it. Be sure to mention the bill numbers. Here's a sample letter. If you like, please modify it to fit your personal experiences. You know, good solid advocacy sorts of, uh, of advice on how to um, get and attract the attention of, of elected officials. But she blasted it to all of her colleagues at school. The school informed her that it was lobbying that was unrelated to her official duties and it violated the school's technology use policy. Um, in the subsequent ethic, executive ethics board hearing, she argued that she was doing union business and that she had not knowingly violated RCW 42 52160. Let's pull that up real quick. when you're doing anything live on the internet, you always risk slow down, especially this time of day. There we go. So Washington legislature has a wonderful website that has um, up-to-date versions of the statutes. It's easy to use. Um, this particular law says that no state officer, state employee may employ or use any person, money, or property under the officer employee's official control or direction or in his or her official custody for the private benefit or gain of the officer, employer, or another. So they found that she knew that she was, um, that the two bills in question, the Court of Appeals found that she particularly knew that she would improve her position if these two bills passed. One of her defenses was, um, I'm doing union business. And she said that I talked to my union. I said, what can I do to help change the situation? Because everyone said it was terrible. They said I could contact the legislature. 
this legislator, but the union couldn't do anything and the administration couldn't do anything. The Court of Appeals rejected her um, argument that she was acting on behalf of the union because the union, under her own words, said that they couldn't do anything about it and that she needed to advocate for herself. Um, her employment was not continued at the end of the semester. She lost her appeal, finding that she had violated RCW 4252-160 and that she was um, doing this in sort of a, for her own personal gain. But there's a wrinkle. And the legislature the next year changed the law. Oops. Excuse my fumble fingers. And they explicitly, at the request of, of organized labor, changed the law to say nothing in this chapter prohibits a state employee from distributing communications from an employee organization union or a charitable organization to other state employees if communications do not support or oppose a ballot proposition or candidate for federal, state, or local public office. Nothing in the section shall be construed to authorize any lobbying activity of public funds beyond the activity permitted by RCW 42, 17A635. And so, um, legislature changed because the Court of Appeals was interpreting the legislature's work. The legislature said, hey, wait a second. We didn't ex intend for our laws to be this clear. We, we just want to prohibit express advocacy for particular ballot propositions or candidates and not broad advocacy for particular statutes. But it shows the peril. It shows the peril that you can lose your job and be, be accused of unethical conduct and that it's, it's, it's dangerous ground. Let's go back and look, unpack the rest of, of chapter 4252. Um, the definition section is important. Agency means any state board in the legislative executive branch of state government. So it's limited to state government and the official duty means those duties within a specific scope of employment of the state officer, state employees defined by the officer employees agency or by statute in the constitution. There's a section 180 that expressly prohibits using public money, public work time, public facilities for express advocacy of um, promotion or opposition of a ballot proposition or election of a person, but there are particular carve-outs. And these carve-outs are mostly for open public meetings by elect elected officials. We're gonna look at the corresponding rules down here in 4217A. So this section for state employees operates to the exclusion of this other section, which governs all other governmental folks. Finally, in 4252, an important section is the whistleblower section, which is uh, 410, which gives whistleblower protection to somebody filing a complaint about um, inappropriate ethical behavior to the executive ethics board. So now I'm gonna to jump to the corresponding part of the statute that governs local entities like, li like library districts and county or city libraries. So RCW 4217A, And it's buried inside the campaign disclosure and contribution law because of the way this came about in Washington's um, legislative history. It came about in the 70s and it was all bundled together. The part that we're interested in is the declaration of policy 
which is very broad and it, it talks about the need for for open government that you know officials deal honestly and fairly with the people and then we want to look at definitions of what an agency is it includes all state and all local agencies And now we want to get to the prohibition section that deals with lobbying, use of public office or agency facilities and campaigns. And so this would apply to our campaigns for, for funding. Um, no elective official may, or an employee may use or authorize the use of any of the facilities of a public office directly or indirectly to assist a campaign for election or promotion or opposition to any ballot proposition. So again, it's express advocacy. And they explicitly include library districts. But this is a carve out. So action taken at a public meeting by members of an elected board or commission to support or oppose a ballot proposition is okay as long as the required notice of the meeting includes the title and number of the ballot proposition and the members of the commission are, um, or members of the public are afforded an approximately equal opportunity for the expression of opposing views. And so if you do it at a public meeting and as part of your, your board meeting, you can talk or the board can take a position on a, on a ballot proposition. An elected official can also do that at an open press conference. And then if there are activities which are part of the normal regular conduct of the agency, you can, you know, if, it's, if you're not actually advocating for something, if you're just sending out information, this is part of your day-to-day -day work, it's fine. It does not apply to state employees. The other law, part of the law from 4252 applies to state employees. They're mirrored sorts of, of law with slight variations. Perhaps the, one more piece before I go to the, the end. Perhaps the, um, you know, the specific rules about lobbying are, are at 17A, 635. These are lobbying by units of government whether state agencies or other units of government. These are actual, the library itself is lobbying and there's specific laws regarding what the library itself can lobby for. The best place to get information, however, is from the public, this is the law itself, but to actually understand what does the law mean on the ground, the Public Disclosure Commission is in charge of it's pdc.wa.gov of um, governing campaign finance and related issues like public agency lobbying. And if you go to local government guidelines, there is a wonderful chart that gives some clarity to it. It talks about persons, what's permitted, what's not permitted, and general considerations. And so, you know, an agency administrator, so director of a library system, community groups that use the facility, a locally elected body, elected officials, appointed officials, management staff, agency employees, union representatives, you know, it gives plenty of good content for what you can and can't do in considerations. This is from the view of the enforcement agency. You could test some of these things in a lawsuit. I'd suggest that that's, um, it's easier to sort of stay within the safe harbors that, the, that they put out rather than to push the envelope. But this is, you know, can I wear a campaign button while on the job if the agency's policy allows employees to wear buttons and they say, you know, that's permitted uh, for agency employees. Those sorts of, of, of advice, this is a great place to go and get it. Okay, I'm gonna end by answering some of the questions that I've gotten in the last few minutes. 
So, Rob, you can see the questions, can't you? Or would you like me to read them aloud? I've got them. Okay. So, I often post to the State Library social media channels information about what services enlist funds in the state. My assumption this is information is not lobbying. And that's exactly right. If we give out information, that's very different than spending money to actively lobby uh, an elected official to give us more money. We're simply disseminating information. That's a safe, that's safe territory. Next question, is there an issue with lobbying emails sent by ALA to your work address? Can just the email being sent to you be a problem? It's arguable that it could be a problem depending on the content of the email. In general, being a member of a professional association and staying up on the professional association's um, activities is part of our professional duty. If you are part of a, um, a committee that's lobbying on behalf of the organization, you need to be really think about the content of, and if you're sending out the emails, what am I doing at work? Is it part of my official duties? Am I speaking for the library or is this me simply speaking on my own as part of my professional worldview? If it's the latter, I would be safe. You're probably not gonna get in trouble for it, but I'd be safe and use your own phone and your own time to do that. Um, bottom line question, is the bottom line that one can communicate using state resources about the presence of a bill issue but cannot advocate which direction to act on it? That is certainly um, safe territory to advocate about its presence. You can also, if you're asked by the legislature to give a position on it, you, the, the agency itself can put out policy guidance about a particular bill or issue as part of the agency's official um, communication pattern. But if it's on the ballot for the public to vote on, as opposed to an issue before the legislature itself, all of the express advocacy rules kick in and you have to pay attention to what those rules are. So follow-up question on the email question on advocacy from ALA or those places. You don't have control about what gets sent to you. Um, there's the de minimis contact rules put out by the Public Disclosure Commission. You can delete things. That's not going to be a problem. Um, I don't think receiving the email itself is going to be a problem where you're going to find issues is if you're part of the creation of such emails and are you doing it in your official capacity or your private capacity or are you blurring the two and if you're blurring the two you need to really think about maybe talk to your supervisor about what am i doing am i speaking for the library or am i speaking for myself in the profession if it's the latter be careful um, you can take, a, you know, be very careful and just have it sent to your home address, but I think you're fine getting those sorts of email blasts at work. It's the forwarding them, commenting on them, adding to them, and then doing it as inside your official capacity when that's not necessarily the library's position that, that you, run, you could run afoul and you could be on, on dangerous ground. It's a little bit past the hour. Um, I appreciate everybody coming. I hope I've um, at least ballparked issues and given you places to go look for answers. Um, I'm afraid I might have just added uh, more confusion and more issues than the answer, but that's kind of the nature of this, that it's uh, each individual situation is unique and you have to think about it. You know, am I ethically required to do this in my role as a librarian? Am, is it part of my official duties? Am I um, doing it the right way if it is? And what are the results? Am I being effective? And frankly, effective advocacy is a whole separate class and something that, um, you're, you know, it's more of an art than a science and your individual skills really come into play. But thanks very much.
Have a good work week. Thanks, Rob. This has been great. I really appreciate it. And for anyone who is attending, we have been recording this webinar and you will, if you register, we will send you a link to the webinar once it's available. And please feel free to share it with anyone that you think would be interested. And thanks again, Rob. We really appreciate it. It's helpful for all of us. My pleasure.